uh, that's uh, my uh, full time job. Um, you know, today uh, I'm happy to be with you all uh, to talk about the sleep apnea in uh, children with the Down syndrome. Um, you know, um, so that's uh, my uh, uh, talk going to be today. Uh, objective of my uh, talk is going to be discuss the risk factor for sleep apnea in children with the Down syndrome, uh, diagnostic approaches, uh, complication of untreated sleep apnea, and then what how we treat actually on the sleep apnea. Um, so I'm going to be talking all of this today. Um, starting with um, you know some basic information. Uh, as you all know, uh, Down syndrome is otherwise uh, called trisomy um, 21, the most commonest genetic disorder in medical field, uh, occurring in one out of every 691 birth. Um, Down syndrome uh, increase the risk of a, a heart defect, gastroesophageal reflex, celiac disease, hypothyroidism, hearing, vision problem, leukemia, Alzheimer's disease, as well as intellectual disability of varying degree on uh, 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 each um, uh, children. Um, when we switching the gear on uh, talking about uh, you know um, you know uh, obstructive sleep apnea, uh, what is obstructive sleep apnea? Uh, obstructive sleep apnea is basically prolonged partial upper airway obstruction or intermittent complete obstruction which uh, normally disturb the normal ventilation. That is basically the breathing mechanism. Um, in epidemiology, that is basically what is uh, general about uh, in a, um, um, sleep apnea. Uh, sleep apnea in general pediatric population is about a two to six percent. Uh, versus when you talk about in uh, children with the Down syndrome, uh, it can be 30 to 50 percent. Uh, also, the age increase uh, in uh, Down syndrome, uh, the chances of obstructive sleep apnea can go up to 90 to 100 percent chance and uh, is well uh, reported in adult uh, uh, Down syndrome. Uh, obstructive sleep apnea also usually more severe in children with a Down syndrome, uh, significantly associated with the low oxygen level compared with the normal children. Also, several manifestations of uh, sleep apnea, um, uh, such as um, you know cognitive impairment, cardiovascular problem, uh, are very common and which may obscure the diagnosis of uh, obstructive sleep apnea in patient with the Down syndrome. Uh, as a physician, we always uh, has a high index of suspicion uh, for uh, screening children with Down syndrome, uh, regardless of uh, symptomatology. Why uh, Down syndrome uh, children are uh, highly uh, prone to develop a sleep apnea? Uh, there are uh, various reasons. Uh, here I am seeing the uh, schematic uh, diagram here. Uh, this is a sagittal section. If you cut the head like this, uh, that section of the um, um, uh, head and neck we are seeing. So here, uh, we see the mid the upper jaw. This is a bone called a maxilla uh, that can be not fully developed. That's called hypoplasia of uh, mid face. Uh, then you can have adenoid, which is very common in any even normal children. Uh, then you can have a big tongue and the tongue prolapse into the airway. Actually, you can see the tongue uh, is actually flip back onto the airway where you breathe, air goes in. So the tongue, uh, you know, uh, prolapsed into the airway, actually going to cause obstruction. Then tonsil, the regular tonsil also can increase the risk of sleep apnea. Um, then muscle weakness, you know, all Down syndrome, all low uh, muscle tone, or we call them as a hypotonia, uh, that also can increase. Then they can have a weakness in the larynx called laryngomalacia, very floppy airway. Then they can have a stenosis, narrowing of windpipe, um, that's called a subclotic stenosis, uh, tracheal stenosis. Then they can also have a hypothyroidism. As you all know, every Down syndrome children uh, need to be uh, screened about their hypothyroidism uh, annually. Um, that also increases the risk of uh, sleep apnea. Then there is a group of tonsil in the back of the tongue. We call them lingual tonsil. 
uh, that also can increase the risk of uh, you know, obstructive sleep apnea. And then mandible, the lower jaw also not fully developed. So in this picture, uh, out of this uh, tonsil and adenoid, uh, other factor are very unique for children with the Down syndrome. That's why uh, if you look at the literature, why Down syndrome children are very, very, very highly prone to develop sleep apnea is because of this. In addition, one of the point I didn't mention here, same age, same gender of any child with the Down syndrome, with the normal Down syndrome, Down syndrome children are going to be overweight. Uh, their BMI is going to be, the body mass index is going to be very high as well. So in general, um, in obstructive sleep apnea, uh, obesity also one of the high reason, one of the common reason for obstructive sleep apnea. So that also should be considered in children with the Down syndrome. What are the common presenting symptom? You can uh, divide them into night symptom, daytime symptom, a night symptom, snoring. But one thing I want to tell, uh, snoring uh, in the absence of sleep apnea, can snoring happen in uh, children with the Down syndrome? Yes, very common uh, because of uh, they, their muscle tone is very, very, very weak. It, it, you know, the airway doesn't vibrate to produce the snoring sound. So one of the very important thing I want to convey here is that, um, you know, children with the Down syndrome, you may not expect, a, you know, big, like a grown man snoring. That's what the parent report. That snoring may not happen and uh, children can have a, uh, you know, sleep apnea. Then you can see apnea that basically you stop or skip breath. Uh, then paradoxical movement, we call them as a, you know, uh, uh, belly, you know, belly breathing, uh, instead of chest breathing, you can see the uh, uh, you know, uh, belly breathing that's called a paradoxical movement. Restless sleep, tosses and turn a lot. Uh, sweat, they can uh, more at the night time. Uh, abnormal sleeping position, uh, very commonly reported by parents to me all the time. And, uh, you know, then bedwetting, uh, bedwetting, prolonged bedwetting, bedwetting is being a problem. Uh, it can also uh, uh, contribute from the sleep apnea because uh, when the oxygen drop, it stress the heart and that, uh, you know, uh, stretching the heart, release some chemical, that chemical make you to pee a lot. So that's the one of the reason why uh, bedwetting, uh, even normal children, not, not necessarily in Down syndrome, even in normal children, we always uh, do sleep study to rule out, uh, you know, um, actually sleep apnea, if they have a bedwetting is being the problem. Then moving on to the daytime, uh, you know, symptom, uh, excessive daytime sleepiness, very common older Down syndrome children and even young adult Down syndrome, they all can have a feeling a sleepy, tired during the daytime. That's one of the common things we always, um, you know, uh, look for. Uh, mood changes, then internalizing and externalizing. That means, you know, uh, somatic complaint. They complain like, you know, pain, um, social withdrawal, uh, those things that can uh, be reported. Then externalizing, aggression, uh, impulsivity, hyperactivity, oppositional uh, behavior, and then conduct problem all can happen in Down syndrome. Basically, it's a give a ADHD like a symptom. And then uh, learning problem, academic problem also can be reported. So this is the one of the very peculiar body position. If you look at most of the parents, what I hear from them. So this is one of my patients. We actually published, I published a paper on this actually when I did my fellowship in Cleveland Clinic. Uh, what I did actually, I looked at the 17 uh, of uh, Down syndrome children, same age, same gender, normal, healthy children. I compared these two groups and uh, what I found that more than half of the Down syndrome tend to sleep like this, uh, like Indian uh, know, position or uh, frog-like. Uh, position, uh, you know, you can describe whatever the way they want, uh, you know, basically uh, they bend the belly forward and put the head down. That's what they sleep in. And uh, what I found that actually um, in that particular position, 
uh, sleep apnea numbers were very less. So when when we conduct the sleep study, we can actually look for a sleep apnea in each position. So some of you may be familiar uh, that that's why sleep tech come and ask you to you know, uh, sleep on your back because uh, sleeping on back more high likely to have a sleep apnea. So when we do, we mark everything on the, there is a sensor. When you do the sleep study, uh, body sensor is attached. That will give us a, what position you are sleeping in. Also in the video we look at and we compare with that. So, you know, when I did that and I found this, when Down syndrome children sleep on this particular position, we see sleep apnea number is very less. So we think that maybe they are protecting their airway by sleeping this way. So one of the other concern comes to think is, um, is the sleep study required to diagnosis. Uh, unfortunately, um, it is the only way to, you know, confirm, uh, you know, um, we, uh, you know, I have seen about 180 Down syndrome children in the last eight years in Louisville. And, uh, you know, um, really uh, how many of them we had a problem in getting a sleep study? I can count. Uh, I can remember only two Down syndrome had an issue in uh, getting the sleep study. Even of one of that, actually we were able to get the sleep study done. Uh, you know, so, um, you know, um, um, a real, you know, really the uh, in-lab sleep study is uh, more helpful than any other testing. However, uh, you can put on pulse oximeter, you know, basically uh, the medical equipment company can come and put a, uh, oxygen monitoring at home overnight. Uh, that doesn't give a more accurate reflection of what is going on. But if we if, if cannot do anything, then it can be an, an option. Um, we are um, doing a currently study on children, NIH granted study in children now, uh, looking for urinary marker. Uh, when the body undergoes stress, it can release some chemical and we are catching up that uh, comparing with the sleep study. There are some report already done, research done in the past with the children and the adult. So we are also redoing it now uh, in our uh, patient population now. Uh, that can be sometimes useful. Then artificial intelligence is coming on everywhere, as you all know. Uh, logic learning machine may be something like that in future. Maybe down the road, another five years, 10 years, we may get some artificial intelligence to pick up some of the uh, component in, uh, from home at itself. So currently American Academy of Sleep Medicine uh, recommend a full EEG on uh, children with the Down syndrome. Uh, in the sleep study, we call the you know, sleep studies of the polysomonogram. As I said, that's a method of uh, you know, um, uh, diagnostic test. That's the gold standard we call. And you know, um, what we look for in uh, an, um, uh, sleep apnea in children, uh, mild one above one to 4.9, moderate above five to 9.9, .9, severe is 10 or above. Versus in adult, this number, the mild is five to 15, uh, moderate 15 to 30, and severe is more than 30. So currently, we do not use any home study for any children. Uh, maybe it can be helpful, some of the normal adolescent, uh, but in general, most of the uh, no, um, sleep center nationwide, they do not do the home study as compared with the adult. Um, so what is there? What are we doing? Where I'm talking about all is all based on the guidelines we have. Uh, this is one of the guidelines actually um, um, done by American Academy of Sleep Medicine in 2010. Uh, big task force uh, sit together, uh, looked at the, all the research data, and they found that you know prevalence of sleep apnea in Down syndrome, as you see here on highlighted, 57 to 100 percent chance of sleep apnea. And then also they said that all the Down syndrome must have a sleep study prior to doing any intervention. Like a, if you are planning to take the tonsils and the adenoid, better to have the sleep study, get the baseline done, what is going on. And then if I need to repeat, you can repeat after the sleep study. Same thing, this is on 
you know american uh, academy of otolaryngology and the head and neck surgery the basically the ent doctors association uh, academy they also said that all the down syndrome should have a sleep study done prior to doing any adenotonsillectomy or removing the tonsil and the adenoid similarly uh, american academy of pediatrics uh, you know we have a well child checkup for normal children and any children on an american academy of pediatrics and what they stated in 2011 is on health maintenance that basically on well child visit every as i highlighted here on in yellow every down syndrome children regardless of symptomatology whether you snore or not should have a screening test done by age of 4 so that that is one of the statement they made and uh, most of our primary care pediatric doctor they send and uh, we screen them most of the children what are the other sleep related breathing disorder we see them in down syndrome children central sleep apnea so obstructed to sleep apnea something blocking in your airway right so central sleep apnea brain lower part of the brain and that's what to control the breathing pattern so problem arises there then that give a central sleep apnea we were able to by looking at the sleep study we are able to distinguish whether it is obstructed to sleep apnea or central sleep apnea so down syndrome central sleep apnea is are very commonly reported because of low muscle tone and as well as as i said at the immature brain stem one of the reason then hyperventilation what do you mean by hyperventilation hyperventilation you should you know you when you breathe in and out you inhale oxygen you exhale the carbon dioxide right when you breathe you breathe out the carbon dioxide in hyperventilation your breathing will be very shallow you don't let the carbon dioxide go out breathe out so you retain a more carbon dioxide in your body and that lead into a you know, sleepiness a tiredness and so on uh, why that happen because of overweight and then low muscle tone and then uh, finally you can have a without sleep apnea either obstructive sleep apnea or central sleep apnea you can have a called a sleep related just a low oxygen alone uh, basically oxygen run constant the all night in a low range uh, that is due to low functional reserve in the lungs and then uh, down syndrome children with a cardiac problem they can have a pulmonary hypertension one of the blood vessel run into the lung you know um, regular blood pressure is uh, you know uh, systemic blood pressure we call a systemic hypertension so the pulmonary the, the veins connecting artery connecting the lungs and uh, heart that's called the pulmonary hypertension that can be one of the problem and then lung disease down syndrome children can have a lung disease also so that also make them to have a low lying uh, oxygen level what happen if you don't uh, treat the sleep apnea so basically untreated sleep apnea complication uh, as we mentioned here and uh, daytime sleepiness uh, motor vehicle accident uh, cognitive dysfunction more of a behavioral issue adhd like a symptom impaired work performance impaired school uh, performance um, then uh, metabolic effect your in insulin resistance can go up there is actually sleep apnea untreated sleep apnea increase risk of developing a diabetes type 2 diabetes then other metabolic syndrome your cholesterol triglyceride all the numbers it can go up as well when you look at the cardiovascular uh, you can have a pulmonary hypertension which we talked about it uh, then systemic high blood pressure also uh, example in an adult then adolescent adolescent high bmi elevated blood pressure your pre test probability for having a sleep apnea very 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 high uh, then that can lead into i know um, a fib untreated sleep apnea very very well reported in adult literature uh, any an adult have a developed a new onset of um, you know a fib uh, if they snore they have to look for a sleep apnea if you correct the sleep apnea the a fib the irregular rhythm can control you know, very well 
So that also can happen in children. Then in the first year of life, like a you know, newborn with a Down syndrome, uh, if they have a bad sleep apnea, uh, they can have a failure to thrive. They cannot actually gain the weight at all because they spend all the calories on struggle uh, breathing actually. So they cannot gain the weight at all. And particularly there are other trisomies, which is very uncommon, but we see them like a trisomy 18, trisomy 13, we see them. I have seen a patient trisomy 18 and all and 13 and all, you know, they all have a very bad sleep apnea and have a first year of life is very difficult for them to gain a weight and so on. What are the treatment options available there? You know, and uh, um, so the first line treatment, if any children uh, have a, you know, grade one to four, as in a, um, in a uh, tonsil. We grade the tonsil, one is small, four is the biggest. Anybody has a more than one size, uh, better to have the tonsil and the adenoid removed. First, that's the first line treatment. Then based on other findings, you can do the tongue base reduction. There is a lingual tonsillectomy. Then the lining of the nose can be trimmed. Then there is a new device called a hypoglossal nerve stimulator. Uh, I am going to briefly talking on all of those you know, uh, in the next upcoming few slides. Uh, so these are all the individualized uh, preparation we can do for treatment we can do for uh, based on what we see on each Down syndrome and the normal children. Uh, CPAP is the second line treatment. Uh, Sometimes uh, sleep apnea is not bad. Complaints can be a problem. Uh, behavioral issues going on. If you don't want to treat, you can wait and watch. Oxygen supplement, particularly first year of life, CPAP is very hard to put them on and FDA are not approved. So you can use them. And then there is a medical treatment. You can use a nasal steroid spray, uh, you know, singular, the Monte Lucas, the allergy pill. Uh, you can use them as well. Then oral devices can be used. And then there is a new thing, novel therapy Stanford invented a couple of years ago. Um, you know, they said a facial exercise basically uh, can improve or can prevent the uh, sleep apnea in uh, children, you know. Um, so uh, starting with the tonsil, adenotonsillectomy, does it cure all the sleep apnea? Not at all. Even normal children, it doesn't. So in Down syndrome, this is one of the data they looked into it. 50 to 70% of the patient with the sleep apnea in Down syndrome continue to have a significant residual sleep apnea after removal of tonsil and adenoid. You know, that's a very important point. That's why uh, we always do sleep study, follow-up sleep study in children with the Down syndrome. I want to make sure that where the baseline of the tonsil. So we do normally after three months of surgery is done, we do the sleep study. Also, one other point I want to highlight is even though it doesn't cure, 50% of the Down syndrome have a reduction in sleep apnea number. If you compare the pre-tonsil and adenoid removal and the post-tonsil and adenoid removal, the sleep apnea number, for example, somebody sleep apnea number of 40, their number can come down to 20. Surgically, it's a good achievement, but 20 still is a high number of sleep apnea. So the, the burden of a disease has gone down but it's still there is a, some amount of burden still going on. That's what we try to treat with the CPAP and other methods. Uh, nasal steroid, um, you know, there are a couple of study done and uh, can be used for mild to moderate sleep apnea or even after the adenotonsillectomy done, we can still use uh, this, uh, you know, nasal steroid singular also like, you know, uh, Monte Lucas, uh, we can use as well. Oxygen supplement, uh, usually tried in the first year of life because that's the time, uh, you know, very hard to put the mask and uh, getting a proper mask, um, but, you know, that can be done. Or any complicated children who are not in, in a position to uh, use uh, CPAP or any other surgical option, uh, oxygen uh, supplement can be considered. And there were old school of thought that it may affect the breathing. It may cause more carbon dioxide to re retain. Uh, but recently, Cincinnati children done 100 and ch 120 children who are on oxygen supplement. 
they mentioned their paper research stated that actually is not happening. Actually, they are not keeping the uh, uh, carbon dioxide mode when you give the oxygen supplement. We do, we do a lot of children, first year of life, whether Down syndrome or normal children, uh, we usually use them on oxygen alone instead of CPAP. What about CPAP? Uh, you all know uh, CPAP is continuous positive airway pressure. And, uh, you know, there were randomized control trial on 28 Down syndrome children. They found that a significant improvement in daytime sleepiness, depression, cognitive function with the CPAP use. Also found two third of, uh, you know, uh, children uh, continue to use, um, you know, CPAP at the end of a 12 month trial. Um, you know, CPAP really works well, to be honest with you all. Uh, my Down syndrome population, I see them yearly once. So there are uh, quite a few handful of uh, Down syndrome children. I see them only you know, once in a year. They are very good. And there are some data also uh, suggest that compared with the normal children, uh, Down syndrome children, I think they had gone through so many things. They adopt CPAP use, usage much better than normal children as, as well. And, uh, you know, that, that they're in the literature, actually. Um, highly effective, uh, but you know, poor and a good compliance. A lot of data says three to five hours per night. That's what children use. Uh, side effect, skin changes, eye irritation, nasal congestion, runny nose. Long-term effect on teeth and, uh, you know, the mid-face here, upper jaw may happen, but they are all very, 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 very pre, uh, what do you say, uh, what do I say, you know, it's uh, only a couple of data there, uh, but I want every parent, uh, but not in a significant way, so going to disfigure somebody, anything like that, you know, so, you know, uh, then the pressure changes, you know, we need to, if somebody like a four-year-old, six-year-old, I put them on, their pressure requirement going to have a changed actually regularly, so I have to do a sleep study on a regular uh, uh, and, um, 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 every two to three years time. Uh, one thing about a CPAP is not FDA approved under a body weight of 40 pound and also under the age of 70 years. Uh, but in a pediatric world, when you come to the hospital, 70% of them are not FDA approved stuff. We use them, unfortunately. Many medications are not FDA approved, you know. Uh, however, uh, this also changed with each uh, CPAP manufacturing company. Uh, some of them even go with the 60 pound, um, you know. Uh, one other thing I have a problem in, in, uh, down, in, um, in uh, Louisville, our uh, Kentucky state, uh, some of the DME, anybody don't meet this criteria, they refuse to give a CPAP. And we struggle, we're trying to explain to them and uh, then I get the CPAP, you know. Um, you know, that's one of the problem we face. But so far, uh, with the Down syndrome children, I didn't have any major issue. Uh, similarly, there's a children with the Prader Willi and all, they are more likely going to have a you know, uh, CPAP. So, you know, uh, sometimes we face the difficulties getting CPAP. So, this is the methodology we go with. So, any children with the sleep apnea, A, uh, is bad, go on to see the ENT doc, get the tonsil done. Mild, not big tonsil. Hey, put them on uh, an, uh, a nasal steroid and a flow nase or rhinocord kind of nasal spray, put them on or singular, put them on for six month follow up. Uh, in an infant, uh, really bad, put them on oxygen. So we follow up. And then if it's still ongoing, then we start them on CPAP, right? When the CPAP fail, then we look for other reasons. You know, that's the standard of practice because uh, when the CPAP fail, this is what we look for. Another thing is called drug-induced sleep endoscopy. We call them DICE. So basically, uh, you know, children are put into sleep by, you know, giving a sedation. Or look at the airway dynamics. Actually, you pass the camera uh, scope, uh, look at the, you know, upper airway dynamics. That's all the picture here. Uh, you can see how the nose part, how is the lingual tonsil part, how is the 
when you breathe in and out, how the airway collapsing, how that is causing the obstruction. So those other things like you know, um, in the larynx, the voice box weakness, all can be seen on actually, you know. By doing that, what they found, uh, one fourth of children had a tongue-based obstruction, you know. So tongue, you know, uh, Down syndrome children, tongue can be very bulky. It go and block the airway. And then epiglottis, this is the epiglottis uh, in the larynx. Actually, that also collapse on the airway, causing the obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, so that can be helpful to identify. Then MRI sleep study. So what do you do? You give a sedation, you put the child into sleep. Then you look at the airway dy dynamics. So when you inhale and exhale, we look for on the MRI, we look for, hey, where is the level of obstruction is happening on? Here are some of the example, uh, tongue collapse, go into the thing. You can see this picture, you can see this narrowing. So tongue is pulling backward into the airway. And here <clears throat> you can see when the inhale, you can see this exhaling, you can see this, you know, airways being collapsed like this. So this is a very useful. Uh, again, Cincinnati, they did a really lot of thing. We are also able to do this actually. And, uh, you know, uh, then other surgeries. Uh, one, one of the thing I mentioned uh, is a lingual tonsil. So this is the tongue. You can see this uh, bulky tissue on the both side. So that's called a lingual uh, tonsil. So your regular tonsil are going to be this side. So this is the child tonsil, lingual tonsil is, you know, the regular tonsil is gone. After removal, this tonsil pop up, you know, uh, this is, the, you know, you can see how airway completely blocked here. So ENT surgeon actually laser them, actually laser shaving this, trim them back. And uh, that can improve the airway. Uh, that's called a lingual tonsillectomy. And then uh, tongue base, if a bulky tongue, you can reduce the tongue size. Then nasal lining is a blocking. You can do that as well. Trimming of the nasal lining also can be done. Uh, this is a rapid maxillary expansion. Is the American Academy of Pediatrics is not approved with it, uh, but still, if you have a very your upper palate, the hard palate is very narrow, then the maxillary expander can be helping, and that can be opening up the airway. Even those not FDA approved, I have a couple of patients. Uh, who did very well on this. Uh, they were on CPAP and then uh, this was done. And then subsequently, follow-up sleep study showed improvement in sleep apnea and uh, CPAP gone, CPAP removed actually, you know. Then myofunctional therapy. Uh, what the Stanford did, uh, 200 children uh, in a fascia maxillary clinic had a physiotherapy to the face. I'm going to show the picture of that, what physiotherapy they did. 200 children did not have a, you know, um, this physiotherapy. So at the end of two years, what they found, children who had an exercise to the face, they didn't develop much of sleep apnea. Uh, so that's there. And, uh, you know, these are all the technique methodology. Sorry, the upper part is a little bit cut off. Uh, you can see that uh, how they strengthening the all the upper airway muscles, everything. Uh, that prevent developing sleep apnea. Uh, so is there, uh, you know, uh, sometime it can be useful as well. Weight loss. Uh, this is based on normal children. Uh, Cincinnati does some of the adolescent uh, bariatric surgery management. So they found that um, definitely sleep apnea get better after the weight loss surgery, uh, you know, they are not going to do only for sleep apnea. If you have a diabetes, a high blood pressure, other things coming on, uh, you know, there, there, there is a lot of criteria. Uh, when they go undergo, they looked at the, uh, what the effect of sleep apnea, sleep apnea get better. And uh, that is there in adult literature, um, you know, really when you use 100, you know, 60, 60 to 100 pound weight loss, sleep apnea disappear. And when I did my fellowship in Cleveland, we used to have all the adult uh, weight loss surgery program. Uh, they had a huge grant at that time. They used to have a study before gastric bypass, after the gastric bypass. 
most of the sleep apnea were actually disappear after the gastric bypass in adult, uh, um, you know, uh, population. So that is there. Uh, this is the recent most uh, treatment. Uh, some of you heard. Uh, this is, uh, you know, um, hypoclassal is one of the nerve. It uh, actually supply the muscles of the lower jaw here, tongue and all those things. And you implant a device uh, like a pacemaker that electrode attached to the nerve. And when you go to sleep, you turn on, it stimulate, it to keep the patency of the airway. Uh, FDA approved at present at age 22 plus an adult who failed to use a CPAP, not failed, who are non-compliant with the CPAP. So that need to be documented actually. You have to use a certain amount of period. If you cannot keep up your compliance, your sleep apnea is a reasonable number, then this device. So this is more than, I think three, 4,000 cases were done worldwide now. It's there about 12 years now in the field. Uh, the Boston children did a pilot study. That means a small sample of study initially uh, in 2016. And uh, they found that on Down syndrome children, very useful. And now uh, six academic center, they did an initial study now. Uh, Cincinnati is one among them, Emory in the Atlanta. Uh, so. Uh, you know, uh, they found uh, 20 children they study, they found us very useful. The age group uh, Down syndrome children is 10 year plus. And, uh, you know, uh, there is a lot of criteria what to be included, what not to be included on those things. Uh, so this is the stimulator. You can see this like a pacemaker is put on the chest wall. Electrode goes to the nerve to stimulate. And, uh, you know, um, you adjust, you know, based on setting you also repeat the sleep study, then they find how much of the stimulation you need, then you fix with that stimulation and really prevent the sleep apnea. Uh, this is the one of the recent most, uh, you know, um, uh, recent most uh, advancement in um, sleep apnea management in Down syndrome children. So in conclusion, uh, uh, you know, children with the Down syndrome, highly prone to develop a sleep apnea, there are various type of sleep disorder breathing and um, you know, uh, very important to see and to look for it. Um, you know, um, sleep study is the main uh, way of uh, confirming the uh, sleep apnea in children. Uh, treating sleep apnea uh, definitely improve their uh, neurocognitive, basically their uh, hyperactivity, daytime problems and uh, mood all can get better. In addition, a long-term heart uh, effect, uh, they can actually have a healthy heart and as well as it also can be helpful on diabetes and other, you know, cholesterol and other metabolic problems. Uh, thank you guys for listening to my lecture and, uh, um, you know, I am happy to take a question uh, if you guys have any questions. Thank you so much. So much great information. Does anybody have any questions? specific situations that you want to ask about? Say yes. Yes. That's a question. Great. Go right ahead. Um, our question is, is our son is uh, 45 years old and he was diagnosed with uh, sleep apnea when he was probably about 18, 19, and he's been on a CPAP machine ever since. Um, they constantly want to do another sleep study, which we've tried twice, and he will not keep the leads on, will not do it. Any suggestions? I, I mean, can you put him to sleep to do that? That doesn't seem like that would work real well, but I'm open to any suggestions. Excellent question, excellent question. So, um, you know, uh, number one, um, if you give any sedation, um, that can induce a sleep apnea. So that's the reason either in children or adult, we do not do the sleep study with the sedation on. So that's the one thing. So the sedation part. So number two, uh, for your son, uh, probably home study can be helpful at least to see where we are. You know, in uh, in-lab sleep study, 
uh, we attach about a 25 to 28 wire sensor put it home study only six or seven so it's going to be like a, putting a gadgets you know few things that's all so that can be considered and then uh, third thing uh, whoever you are a sleep doctor uh, wherever they do sleep lab uh, trying to work with them also can be helpful uh, example i'll tell i have a young adult came from lexington they couldn't get the sleep study done and so i was you know when i saw the patient in my clinic he came to me age of 24 and uh, you know i was able to tell my team uh, try our best we got the you know uh, sleep study conducted completely very well he stopped breathing 110 times per hour same patient we put them on cpap he hated didn't like it at all then i switched him into bipap my god mother actually was so happy that his mood daytime function completely changed this is a down syndrome uh, young adult i'm talking about mm -hmm. you know so those uh, three things ma'am actually uh, you know um, you can consider you know uh, so no sedation i would not give a sedation but you can consider something like a melatonin something melatonin doesn't affect actually on sleep apnea outcome but any other sleep aid like a, you know um, um, you know alprazolam xanax or clonazepam uh, those things can actually can cause a sleep apnea but he can try it, melatonin if you want uh, but no other sedation number 2 portable you know home study can be considered uh, number 3 uh, work with um, you know your son and uh, you know your sleep staff team uh, you know you, 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 your son can go to the sleep lab during the daytime get familiarized with the, all the thing what do they use spend time with the sleep technician during the daytime uh, one day and then go to the sleep lab so that way uh, some of the the you know uh, and the component that can be uh, minimized and uh, successfully can be conducted thanks for the ideas appreciate it yeah thank you great anybody else have any questions no like I said, thank you, Dr. Sen, for the information. And I think it'll be um, served not just people who are here, but ones you know that we share this recording with and share the podcast with globally as well. So we are thankful for your dedication. Um, I know a lot of our families have trouble finding a general practitioner for their adults. Mm -hmm. Do you have any comments on that or any um, know of anyone to send them to? Uh, general practitioner? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, I think Norton is a definitely have a big network now. And, uh, you know, uh, I think um, shouldn't be a problem. If you have anything, uh, you you guys can let us know. Um, my office number is 588-2220. Uh, my manager can work on that if they have any difficulty in getting on. They can give a feedback on that. You know, we are uh, really, you know, with uh, now university and uh, not an uh, pediatric, both integrated, um, if, you know, uh, for last one year now. And uh, big group of uh, primary care available, I think, uh, in both, you know, now. So that's great. Be... That's great. Yes. Thank you. We, we have a lot of pediatricians, it seems like, are easier to find that they have either spe not specialized in Down syndrome, but are very familiar with Down syndrome. It's mm -hmm. the adult, the adults, once they kind of age out of their pediatrician, we, we they yeah. have lost contact. So we'll, I will give you a call and maybe see if your office manager can give me some suggestions and um, appreciate any input you have on that. Okay. So, all right. Anybody else have any questions on the sleep apnea? This morning, if not, we'll let you go enjoy your Saturday, although it's a little right. rainy outside. <laughs> yeah, thank you for this opportunity, Guy. Thank you all. Thank you so much. We will stay in touch. We appreciate your expertise. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.